Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our live seminar series. My name is Olivia Lanes from IBM Quantum, and I'm very excited to be here today with Liang Zhang of uh, the University of Chicago and Amazon. So we'll give everyone just a few minutes here to tune in before we get started, and then I will introduce uh, our speaker for the day, who will be talking to us about quantum networks and quantum data centers. Okay, who will be talking to all right, just give everyone a second here. I am tuning in from Yorktown Heights in New York, where the IBM Quantum Lab is based. All right. Um, I think everybody is just about ready. Okay, I think we are ready to get started. All right. So good afternoon, everybody. We are thrilled to roll out the last latest episode of the Quantum Seminar Series dedicated to the research and academic quantum communities. Our seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time right here and is hosted on the Kiskit YouTube channel. I'm your host for today. My name is Olivia Lanes from IBM Quantum, and I'm very excited to be here today speaking with Liang Zhang, um, and he will be talking to us about quantum networks and quantum data centers. All right, welcome, Liang. Uh, it's great to have you here today. I will just give a brief introduction. Um, so uh, Professor Liang Zhang is a professor in the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago and an Amazon scholar um, on quantum computing. He received his bachelor's degree from Caltech in 2004 and his PhD from Harvard in 2009. He was a faculty member at Yale University uh, from 2012 to 2019, and his research focuses on quantum control and error correction to build large scalable quantum systems. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society and also a recipient of the Sloan Research Fellowship, the Packard Fellowship, and the APS Landauer Bennett Award. So thank you so much for being here with us today. We're really excited to, uh, to get started here and to hear about the quantum networks. Hi, Olivia. Hey, yeah, it's a great pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to talk about uh, this recent progress about quantum networks and the quantum data center. And uh, so, so I think that uh, maybe let me start with actually some potential like uh, challenges and also like uh, also applications of quantum networks. So. So I guess that uh, people might have heard quite a lot about like uh, the potential applications of quantum networks, including secure communication and also quantum computing in the over the cloud. And also you can build quantum sensors and also play quantum games over the network. And one of the major challenge for large scale quantum network is actually due to the uh, quantum channel loss. So, um, so, so far, like some of most of the demonstrations are of the scales of tens or hundreds of kilometers, it's mostly because actually our fiber channel has attenuation. And typical scale of the attenuation lens is about 20 kilometers uh, with the, the best choice of the wavelengths. And uh, if you go from like uh, 20 kilometers to like a thousand kilometers, you'll find that your communication rate decreases exponentially. So suppose you have like a terahertz key generation rates to send like single photons, then the probability you will receive a single photon after a thousand kilometers is actually would take like a, almost a few months, a few years to get a single photon. So that becomes practically useless to achieve any of a secure quantum communication. And moreover, the other imperfections such as detector noise and so on will kick in and you are actually essentially detecting the random detector noise. So to overcome this uh, fiber attenuation, there are actually like uh, two approaches. So one approach is to go to outer space. For example, you can use satellite and use satellite to relay the quantum signal. And uh, fortunately, the atmosphere is not too thick so that we can still have a good chance in sending photons between uh, communicating between satellite and the ground station. And moreover, if you have multiple satellites, you might be able to communicate between satellite outer space without suffer from the loss due to the atmosphere or fiber. However, there are also limitations of the satellite-based quantum communications or quantum networks. One is actually limited bandwidth. And also it depends on weather. If it's a cloudy day, you might not be able to have a direct optical communication between your satellite and the ground station. And also it's very expensive to launch or repair. 
On the other hand, the other option is actually to build quantum repeaters, and uh, which actually can, uh, although hasn't been demonstrated, it may have the potential that it can be compatible with our optical fiber network. And also it probably will be more reliable, doesn't depend on weather, and potentially have much higher bandwidth compared to the satellite links. So in today's talk, the first half of today's talk, I'll be mostly talking about quantum repeaters, how we can actually uh, use ideas from quantum control and error correction to build more robust quantum repeater so that we can achieve fast uh, and uh, fast quantum communication over long distances. So before we get to the quantum repeater, it might be good to first look at what we do with our classical world, with the classical repeaters. And actually, we've been using classical repeaters for centuries, including that you can use a smoke signal to communicate between different stations. For example, in, in China, the Great Wall, which is more than 6,000 years ago, they actually used a smoke signal to communicate between stations. And that smoke signal, can you can relay so that you can get a signal like thousands of uh, hundreds of miles away. And in Africa, people also use sound to actually communicate and relay the signal. And nowadays in our optical fiber networks, the under ocean cables, we also use our optical signal to, uh, but these are uh, to communicate and send the, and the relay signal over long distances. So all these classical repeater schemes have a common underlying principle, which is to duplicate and amplify classical signals. In the quantum world, however, we actually have this no cloning theorem saying that unknown quantum states cannot be perfectly cloned. And this actually poses a challenge. And on the other hand, it is also the no cloning theorem that enables us to achieve a secure communication because our quantum states we want to communicate cannot be cloned by a potential eavesdropper. So with this challenge with no cloning theorem, and moreover, there are also other challenges, including the imperfections such as the fiber loss, also the coupling efficiencies and detector inefficiencies, combined with also the operation errors such as channel decoherence, memory errors, or gates or measurement errors. So this actually poses a challenge to say, how can we achieve long distance quantum communication with lossy channel imperfect gates? On the other hand, there are also opportunities for example, we have quantum entanglement, which does not have a classical correspondence. So we can generate entanglement or distill them. We can use quantum entanglement to achieve quantum teleportation or even perform entanglement swapping to get longer distance entanglement. Moreover, the quantum entanglement also is the underlying idea of these quantum error correction so that you can potentially, even though you cannot amplify the quantum signal, but you can use quantum error correction to protect the encoded logical information from various decoherence and imperfections. Okay, so these are actually the opportunities that will enable us to potentially to achieve like long distance quantum communication in the presence of loss and operation errors. So let's kind of take a kind of a more like a higher level view of how we can correct loss and operation errors. So for loss error, basically you can use quantum error detection or quantum error correction to correct them. So here, what I mean by error detection is that you will use the redundancy that is introduced by quantum encoding to check whether or not error happened. And if error happened, you just discard and repeat the process. While for quantum error correction, when you detect the error, you will actually try your best to correct the error and proceed without discarding the state. So, for quantum error detection, because once you, when you detect the error, you discard the whole, uh, whole state and you need to let the other party know. So therefore it requires a two-way classical signaling between remote parties, which will take time because the speed of light is finite. While for quantum error correction, you actually do not need such a two-way classical signaling. So therefore in principle, you can just send the signal from one party to the other and continue. And there is no need for the backward signaling. So similarly, for correcting loss errors, we can also correct operation errors, such as errors from your gates or measurement by using error detection and or error correction. The difference is again, whether or not you need two-way classical signaling between remote parties. Okay, so now with these different categories of ways to suppress errors, we can classify 
different ways of quantum repeater into three generations. So for first generation quantum repeater, you basically use quantum error detection to detect errors. And if you see the error, you restart. And this actually gives you a much easier approach and hopefully achievable in the near future. And for second generation repeater, because we know usually the error, uh, operation error is much smaller than the last error, we might be able to use error correction to correct operation errors while still use error detection to correct loss error. And suppose as we move on, we have more control and we can correct both loss and operation errors. Then we will introduce a proceed to the third generation quantum repeater, use error correction to correct both loss and operation error. And that gives kind of the three generations of quantum repeaters in terms of the technical, technical challenges. Uh, on the other hand, these three generations also give us different quantum communication rates. For the first generation, because you need two-way signaling to correct both loss and operation errors. So if you communicate over long distances, you still need to uh, signal in back and forth at the end repeater stations. Therefore, the communication rate is limited by the speed of light to transmit over signal across the entire quantum communication channel. However, if you do the second generation, you actually only need a two-way signaling between nearest neighbor repeater stations. So it's limited by the spacing between repeater stations and the connection efficiency, but not the total distance, roughly. While the third generation, because you're doing everything with quantum error correction, and the key communication rate is actually only limited by how fast you can do your local operation which is very similar to our classical communication, which is limited by our modulators, how fast you can uh, switch between zero and ones. So therefore, the third generation has the, the potential to kind of like achieve like ultra fast, long distance quantum communication. And there are lots of experimental progress towards, okay, building quantum repeaters. And for the sake of time, I may not go through all of them, uh, any of them, but uh, actually I will mostly focusing on some of the new theoretical ideas related to the third generation quantum repeaters. So to, to just give you a bit more concrete illustration, so this can think that uh, the third generation quantum repeater, and we also call it a one-way quantum repeater because the information go from one, part, one way and there is no need of backward communication. So that's why we call it the one-way quantum repeater. You basically encode quantum information at a repeater station and send the encoded information over a lossy fiber channel. And at the next repeater station, you collect the, the photons from the previous station and try to do your error correction to correct the loss errors from the fiber channel, as well as operation errors. And then you re-encode and send it to the next repeater station. So this is a repeated way of doing the encoding, uh, sending over lossy channel to error correction and send over to the next repeater station. And this procedure will allow us to send quantum information over long distances in the presence of fiber loss channel. So a natural question would be, what is the maximum amount of quantum information can be transmitted over such a lossy fiber channel, which is related to the concept called quantum channel capacity? And then suppose we know what the capacity is, how can we achieve it with efficient quantum error correcting codes? So in, in, in re review of this quantum channel capacity, it actually will be good to look into what we do with the classical world. In the classical domain, we also have a similar situation. In our classical communication channel, there's a question about what is the classical channel capacity, which actually Shannon kind of post introduced this concept about like 70 years ago. And for classical channel capacity, it's actually, it's additive. So when you have two channels, the capacity is the sum of the two capacities. And there are very efficient classical error correcting codes for discrete variable like zero and one, which currently the 5G networks using a classical LDPC code, low density parity check code and the polar code, which actually can asymptotically approach the, the classical channel capacity, which is why our classical 5G network can be really fast. And if we use some other degree of freedom either than binary zero one, sometimes we're actually using continuous variables for example, we send like a weak packets in a bosonic mode, like our Wi-Fi communications. 
then actually we use some coding which is very specifically designed for such a continuous or bosonic degree of freedom, including the phase shifted key in or quadrature amplitude modulations, which are widely used in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So similarly, in the quantum domain, about the 90s, the people start to think about the quantum channel capacity. And one interesting feature that people find is actually quantum channel capacity is very exotic. It can have something called the super additivity. So for some quantum channels, if you have capacity one for one channel, capacity two for another channel, when you, the total capacity for the joint channel can be larger than the sum of the two. And we'll show example later on. Moreover, there are also very interesting developments of quantum error correcting codes. And there are textbook examples of stabilizer codes. And also, more recently, there are these quantum polynomial codes and also quantum low density parity check code, which has a rapid development in the past six or 12 months. And people have shown efficient quantum low density parity check with constant coding rates and the linear scaling of the code distance with the code size. So these are very efficient, uh, very promising codes and which potentially will also be useful for quantum communication. And for continuous variable degree of freedom, you can think that when you communicate with the fiber channels, each of the bosonic, each of the channel mode is actually a bosonic mode. So you may think that take a full advantage of the bosonic nature of these modes. For example, each of the bosonic mode will have many energy levels. Maybe you can encode more than one quantum bits of information with these bosonic modes. For example, you can use CAD code, binomial code, or using the gottesman kittel Presco code to encode more information with these bosonic modes. So let's maybe take a look at uh, uh, one example of this quantum channel with a super additivity. And uh, here, let's just consider, um, for people play with qubits, let's consider qubit depolarization channel. So basically, there is a probability P that your qubit will be depolarized and become a maximum mixed state. And then probability one minus p, the qubit is not changed. Okay, you can write equivalently in terms of the cross operators with the, the qubit state density matrix sandwiched by identities or poly x, y, and z. And if you have a qubit depolarization channel, one natural question is how many, how much quantum information you can send or you can, can you can store with such a qubit. With the if you have no depolarization error, then one qubit can reliably store one quantum bit of information. While you increase the depolarization error, the amount of information you can store will decrease. And at some point, there is no more quantum information you can store because the error is too large. However, we instead of using one qubit, we can use a collection of qubits. For example, we can use three qubits to store one quantum bit of information, like a repetition code. And since you're using three qubits, if you don't have any error, your starting point is each qubit only store one third of a qubit, logical qubit of information. So the starting point is one third. However, because of this redundancy, it actually is a little bit more tolerant against such a depolarization error to the point it may converge and to the point that it may vanish. If we further zoom in at this cross point, what you'll find is that actually the red curve associated with the three qubit repetition code can actually outperform a single qubit code. That indicates that you can actually store a little bit more information when the depolarization error is pretty large around the 0253. Then basically, your three qubit code can store more information than the single qubit coding scheme. That indicates that the, if you use three qubit, which is called one plus one plus one, it actually can be larger than if you just use one qubit three times. So that's why I indicate here the one plus one plus one is larger than three. So this is the example of super additivity showing that you can store more information by collectively using your qubits to store the information. We do and, have a couple questions here. Yes. Um, I mm -hmm. think that would be a good moment. So I think we have a couple different, you know, levels in our audience. And somebody is asking if you could back up and explain what a bosonic mode is quickly. Yes. So a bosonic mode, the easiest way to think is suppose now you have a, a optical cavity, and the, the cavity has its own resonant, different resonant modes, and the, each mode will have its own resonant frequency. But if you pick a frequency, there is a resonant uh, mode inside the cavity, and that corresponds to a bosonic mode. 
and that allows you to store uh, more than potentially store more than one quantum bit of information if there is very little loss. Great. Um, and then another question was specifically what post quantum encryption models are you talking about? ECDH question mark. Oh, here I'm not talking about uh, when you say post, uh, here I'm talking about the quantum encoding, not post quantum encryption. So, so here, um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. I'm not sure I fully understand the question either. So mm -hmm. um, if, if you could clarify, I can ask him again, uh, mm -hmm. Zachary, in the chat. And then last question was, what factors are going to increase the rate of depolarization errors? So here, actually, this is because we're actually using collective encoding over the three modes rather than individual encoding over individual modes. So that collective encoding gives you the power that shows up as a super additivity of the quantum channel. Yeah. So that's that's why actually like it's sometimes you may want to think about like okay how can I encode information collectively okay. over multiple modes or multiple right. bits. Yeah. Sounds good. Or uh, uh, hope that clarified everything. But if not, feel free to ask again. But I think we can keep going for now. Uh -huh. Yeah. So here's just one example showing using quantum bits to uh, to demonstrate some non triviality of the quantum channel. And we know in our quantum communication, usually we actually send individual wave packets uh, over the fiber channels. So those wave packets, you can also think of them as the bosonic modes because they satisfy the commutation relation as the bosons. So for these wave packets or bosonic modes, then we should also think about, okay, what is the maximum amount of information you can send if the wave packets or the modes suffer from loss and also added thermal noise. So that's what we call the thermal loss channel. So there's a fiber attenuation potentially, and more so maybe the fiber will also have added thermal noise, added noise. So here is an example of considering if you have such a channel with both loss and added noise. The horizontal axis indicating the loss rate, and the added noise is just one unit associated with that environment when it's mixing with. Okay, so the vertical axis is the lower bound of the quantum channel capacity, which you can think is how many bits it can encode with each mode. So for example, now suppose you have about like 20% of a loss. Then actually your single mode coding scheme, which is the blue curve, will start to cut off around the 19% loss rate. However, if you do multi-mode, you'll find this red curve, which can be above this blue curve, indicating actually the multi-mode coding, you can actually do better. Now, to intuitively understand why this is the case, here is actually, you can, let's say, let's fix with this 19% loss and the plot, make a plot uh, of the quantum channel capacity versus the average photon number, okay, for the encoding. So here the blue curve indicating that there is actually a minimum threshold of average photon number before you can actually encode useful quantum information over such a thermal loss channel. However, if we could have a multi-mode, then it's actually this red curve, which you can think is a convex hull of the blue curve. So, or more specifically, if you look at, say, we have average photon number for the encoding is 0.8%, uh, 0.8 photon per mode, then the single mode coding scheme would say each mode will have a 0.8 photon. It's actually below the threshold, so therefore you, you cannot send any quantum information over the channel. However, if you do the multi-mode coding, you can actually collect rather than putting an all eggs in individual bucket. You actually put you actually put all eggs in one bucket. That actually gives you a much better performance, because now 0.24 is above the threshold in that mode, so that you can now transmit quantum information over the channel, while the other two channels you essentially just don't use them. So that actually illustrates there is some like uh, super additive behavior for this Gaussian bosonic case. So now, this because of this super additive behavior, it actually makes it, theoretically, it actually makes it harder to say what is the quantum channel capacity, because one plus one could be larger than two. So we need to think about the asymptotic limit with a large n, then what will be the channel capacity? That's why, theoretically, usually, we obtain the upper and the lower bound for the quantum channel capacity. So the, here, we consider, again, thermal loss channel, with the horizontal axis being the loss probability 
go from 0.1% to almost the 50% loss. And we know when we above 50%, there is no channel capacity because otherwise it would be contradictory to the non cloning theorem. And the vertical axis is again the quantum channel, uh, quantum channel capacity in terms of uh, qubits per channel use. And we'll find that actually this blue and the red correspond to upper and the lower bounds. And people are there are still ongoing research to get tighter upper and lower bounds. And can we achieve such upper lower bounds? And what we find is actually using something called the Gottes Mankitel Presco code with multi mode coding, we actually can asymptotically achieve a similar scaling compared to the upper and the lower bounds. So if you have only like a 0.1% loss, then basically the GKP code encoding can asymptotically be very close to the upper and lower bounds up to some constant offset. So that indicates that, yeah, we actually do have good coding, which have a good performance. So maybe for people, for maybe maybe for some audience, it's probably first time to hear about the GKP code. Uh, so, so let's just give you a brief intro introduction. So in the classical domain, we actually encode quantum information using something called the quadrature amplitude modulation. So just think about a single harmonic oscillator. What you can have is encode the state of the single harmonic oscillator in the classical domain. You can characterize it in terms of amplitude and phase. Or you can think it as the position and the momentum of a single harmonic oscillator. Here, they say horizontal axis is position, vertical axis is momentum. Then you will have, uh, you can encode the information in different position and momentum states. And if they are far apart, you can basically distinguish what the state is. For here, I use 16 position momentum states that the log, uh, log 16 gives me four. So basically, you have four classical bits being encoded with such uh, 16 possible states of a harmonic oscillator. In the quantum case, if you want to encode the information, then you can use superpositions of these states to encode. Moreover, and there's also a challenge on the quantum case is that you also want to maintain the superposition of those of the encoded logical states. So, so basically, the idea of a Gottesman Kitaya Presco code is actually to use a superposition of these different coherent states with some carefully chosen lattice spacing and the superposition coefficients to come up with some logical state zero and the logical state one. And here I'm just showing the Wigner function of the logical zero and the logical one of the basis states, the logical states associated with the gottesman kittel presco code. And you see there are definitely negative Wigner functions in here, indicating it requires some quantum nature for to prepare some such, such a quantum state. So it might be tricky to write down explicitly what these coefficients are, especially when you have finite energy. However, to really understand this, you can think that uh, if you're not constrained by the energy, you, the state is actually a co-eigenstate of these two displacement operators. So you consider a position displacement by two square root of pi or momentum displacement by two square root of pi. And these two displacements, they actually commute with each other. So you can, it's possible to find the co-eigenstates, which are Co uh, of these displacement operator with eigenvalue plus one. And it turns out there is a two-dimensional subspace to be co-eigenstates of these two operators with eigenvalue plus one. And that two-dimensional subspace corresponds to the logical state of the gottesman kittel of Presco code. And because these two operators commute with each other, and also it stabilizes, it, ha it has eigenvalue plus one for all logical states. So basically, you can repeatedly measure these two operators and check if there's any change. If these operators deviate, it's indicating that there is some like random displacement in position or momentum, which will change the eigenvalue of these operators. However, measuring these two operators actually do not disclose the encoded logical information. So you can repeatedly measure them and perform error correction of displacement or even loss errors. Okay, so this is kind of a brief introduction of the gottesman kittel presco code. But uh, here, but in case people are interested, I would suggest to read the original paper. And also there are significant experimental advances of GKP codes is trapped ions or superconducting circuits. And recently, Michelle Devereaux's group, the GKP code has achieved or go above the break even, which is a really promising coding platform to correct bosonic errors. So just to give another 
uh, impressive feature of GKP code is it can correct photon loss error very, very efficiently. So here's a plot which horizontal axis is the loss rate, the vertical axis is the fidelity, and you will see that actually the GKP code actually can outperform the other bosonic codes. So basically for a wide range of parameters, GKP code outperform the other bosonic codes. And here the inset is a, a log log plot with a log of the loss rate versus the log of the infidelity. And you'll find that actually the GKP code can suppress the error to 10 to minus four, even though there is a 10% photon loss. So this is actually 10% photon loss is something which is more reasonable and potentially experimentally achievable, but you can still restore the encoded information to such a high fidelity so that you can imagine maybe using GKP code to correct photon loss errors between repeater stations, and then you can relay the signal so that you can probably have a connection over thousand repeater stations to send the information over thousands of kilometers away. And in addition, as a side comment, potentially if you want to use GKP code for quantum computing or do quantum gates, it actually has a deterministic CNOT gate using just Gaussian operations, like a photon squeezing or a bin splitter interaction. And it actually also provides you some analog information so that we can actually infer the likelihood of error rather than the presence or absence of error, which will be actually important later when you want to do decoding. Okay, so um, now this- I have a question for you uh, yeah. before we go too much further. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked, if I understand correctly, GKP codes are achieved using Wigner functions. How physically difficult is it to generate these? Yes, so so for, for that, I would actually like, uh, 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 okay, unfortunately I didn't have the references, but you can look it up with the GKP quantum error question and their experiments with trapped ions, so supernatting circuits. And in order to prepare these Wigner function with negativity, we do need some nonlinearity. And nonlinearity come from sometimes two level systems like ions or Josephson nonlinearity in supernatting circuits. And you can use quantum control techniques to prepare such a non-trivial logical states of GKP code. Cool, thanks. Okay, so um, if that's okay, then let's try to see if we can use GKP code for quantum communication. So one simple way would say, let's just uh, encode with GKP with single mode. And at the next station, we do the GKP error correction and re-encode the GKP and, uh, uh, and, and repeat the process. And one thing we find is that sometimes that you might not be able to really achieve like extremely high fidelity with just a single layer of GKP code. That is why we may want to consider concatenating both the bosonic code, like GKP code, at the physical layer, and up the next layer, consider using discrete variable quantum codes. Because at the, once you did the GKP code, it becomes like a, a discrete, like a logical zero, logical one. Then you want to do another layer of code over the GKP code, that's why you need a discrete variable code, like our 713 code or other quantum error correcting codes we're familiar with. So since we have two layers of quantum error correcting codes, we may think about we might need two types of quantum repeater nodes. So the simple nodes will consist of just doing the GKP error correction at individual repeater nodes, okay? Just to correct individual mode GKP errors, uh, new GKP codes. And then you can have more sophisticated quantum repeater nodes that can correct both individual mode errors as well as the next level of coding, which is intermode with multi-mode encoding. You can correct the residual errors that cannot be corrected by the GKP code. And in principle, you can have, if you have unlimited resources, you can have all qubits, all repeater station being just the, uh, the this uh, like a hybrid in, uh, co code correcting both layers of errors. But if you are limited by physical resources, you may want to alternate or have more like a simple repeater nodes while occasionally you insert a bigger repeater station that can correct errors at both levels. So that was actually the idea of having two types of quantum repeater nodes for the concatenated bosonic and discrete variable quantum error correcting codes. And what we find is actually quite interesting in terms of like how we should do the decoding. Because in principle, uh, you could just use the second layer of coding to do decoding, 
or you could ju just use the GKP to do the decoding. Or maybe you can uh, separately decode information with the Bosani code and the discrete variable code at the next level, which is showing in this purple line, which we said 713 code at the next level, while GKP code, but there is no information exchange between the two layers of coding. What we find is actually if you could do, if you use the information from lower level coding to assist the second layer of coding, you can actually do much better. So for example, we know that 412 code, it can only detect errors, but if you combine that with the GKP code, it can actually achieve a performance, which is this red curve, which is even better than the 713 code with the GKP, but there is no additional uh, kind of analog information from GKP code to assist the second layer of error correction. And moreover, if you use that analog information from GKP code to the next layer of coding, you actually can further advance the 713 code. Used to be like only correct a single error, but now it effectively can correct two errors. And the underlying idea is the following. For example, if you do 412 code, you can only detect error, but with the ambiguity of which uh, discrete variable encoding has the error, but the analog information helps to break the tie so that you know which error to correct. So that's why it's effectively can error detecting code can perform as good as error correction code, and error correcting code can perform even better than without this analog information. And we extend this idea further. Suppose we use the GKP code combined with the quantum LDPC code which is actually like a, a quantum generalization of this classical LDPC code we use in 5G network. Then we can see that on this dashed curve, it corresponds to using quantum LDPC code without using the analog information from GKP code. But if we use analog information, it actually can tolerate much more added thermal noise here, it just shows that sigma. And to a point that it's even beyond what uh, the, the CSS humming bound that uh, associated with the, the quantum classic, uh, the discrete variable code. So therefore it's indicating that having this analog information from the lower level Bosani code can further advance the performance of the next level of quantum error correction. Yeah, so, so far I talked about like mostly about a quantum network, especially about how to establish robust links between remote repeater stations. And for quantum networks, we also have these local kind of quantum nodes, and maybe there are also interesting things we can do for these local quantum nodes. And that's why we actually also look into the second topic, which is called the quantum data center. And in our classical world, we have lots of data centers, which is actually like uh, provide different services and the storage and servers. But in the quantum case, actually there's something maybe similar that maybe we can also use quantum data center. So, to maybe look in, to motivate kind of why we uh, a particular application or design of quantum data center, maybe let's think about one of the major challenges in quantum information processing is actually how to efficiently process large scale classical data with our quantum algorithms. We know that we have lots of classical data stored in our hard drives, right? And our quantum computer can only take like a limited quantum inputs. And how can we actually use our quantum devices to process the classical data. Or put a simple term, suppose you have big data you want to search, and if you want to use global search algorithm with a quantum computer, but how do you have a quantum computer to access the classical data? Yeah. So now the, sorry. No problem. Okay, yeah, so how to use uh, the quantum computer to process classical data. And this actually like, a, uh, if you want to use a global search to search a big data, you want to get the square root again, square root of n like a speed up, and you cannot just look into classical data because otherwise each query will take over the n and you will lose the, the square root of n speed up. And the one way to do it is actually to do something called a quantum random access memory. So in order to understand what the quantum random access memory is, let's first look into what the classical random access memory is. So in the classical RAM, which is also the RAM we have in our classical computers, it's basically given an address, and we want to look into a database and find the output, which actually correspond to the value associated with the address. So the output will be the address and the corresponding value. 
For a quantum random access memory, we may actually accept inputs of address in terms of a superposition of two or more addresses. And here, they will also have another thing we call the bus, which is zero. And then after the query uh, with the quantum random access memory, the output will still be a superposition with the address associated with the corresponding value in the database. So in mathematical terms, you have a superposition of address coming in, and the output will be superposition of address and the corresponding value. And this is actually what we will need for like Grover search or some of the quantum machine learning algorithms. OK, so now how can we actually implement such a quantum random access memory? Because it needs a superposition of address and a superposition of output. So in order to do it, let's maybe think about like routers. OK, so the router is a device that can forward signal to appropriate output depending on the switch state. So there is a signal, there is a switch. And the signal can be classical or quantum, while the switch can also be classical or quantum. So let's look at a simple example when signal is a weak packet, which is classical, while the switch is literally just a switch go up or down. And this is actually a classical router, which determines whether the weak packet will go up or down. And if the signal is classical while the switch is quantum, then the switch can be in a superposition of up or down. When the signal comes in, it will go up or down, and depending on the switch. And then when you measure the signal in up or down ports, essentially you projectively measure the switch state in up or down. So this case, we can think of it as a measurement device, with the signal measure the state of the switch. Well, you can also have your signal being quantum while the switch being classical. And this is actually the quantum router, which we actually use for quantum networks. Because if you have a quantum state you want to send to Bob or Charlie, then the switch will determine whether the state is sent to Bob or Charlie without measuring the state of the quantum state. Now, the more exotic case is that both the quantum signal and the switch are quantum which we call the quantum controlled quantum signal router or Q square router, then this is something that you have a superposition of a quantum state coming in with a switch in superposition up and down. The quantum states will end up in a superposition of up and down while maintaining the original superposition of a quantum state. So this actually will be something which will be useful for quantum random access memory. Okay, so now let's see how we can use such a quantum controlled quantum signal router to build a quantum random access memory. So here is an illustration on the left, which suppose we router will be in a serial position state, let's call it A, and the incident state, which is the signal, it's in state B, the cat indicating it's a quantum state. And so now if A is zero, the router state is zero, then the incident state will route it towards the left output. If the router state is one, the incident state will route it towards the right output. And for simplicity or for clarity of the explanation, let's just also assume the router state can have a third state, which is a waiting state. So basically, the incident will stay remain as the incident uh, remain as the input ports. Okay. So this is actually like nothing magical. You can use a quantum circuit to implement such a quantum router which suppose the router can have a state 0, 1, or w. If the router is 0, it swap between the incident and the left input. So the inf incident state go to the left output. If the router state is 1, it swap between incident and the right output, so the incident goes to the right output. If it's in w, then nothing happened to the incident. OK, so this is kind of a simple quantum circuit illustration of the router. So Basically, the quantum router does not increase the computational power. On the other hand, it can helpful in terms of achieving some like of non-trivial non quantum tasks. So now suppose we have such a quantum router. We can actually implement a quantum random access memory. So in order to implement a QRAM, we can actually put a tree, a binary tree of routers where routing sit, routers sitting on the nodes of the tree. Well, the leaf of these, this binary tree is connected to the classical memory, which will deterministic, which can implement some unitary operations at the end. And we have an address. In this case, it's a three quantum bits of address with 101 indicating 
the fifth location of the memory. And we have a bus which is initialized in the zero state. Okay, so, so with this control, with this quantum control, quantum signal router, and the address will, uh, with the address input, it can carve out a particular path because one goes to right, zero goes to left, one goes to right. It will actually map a direct path to the fifth of the memory. And then we can use the bus to, uh, bus state will be passed along this path to the, in, to close to this fifth memory. And then the location of this fifth memory can execute a unitary depending on the value of x5 is zero or one. If it's zero, it does nothing. If it's one, it flips the output. So therefore the state of the bus gets converted to x5, which is associated with the value of the classical memory in here. And this is executed in a unitary fashion, which you can see it here. You can reverse the process as well, if you want. So therefore, in this particular case, the fifth, you read out the fifth memory. But the, since the whole process is a unitary process, you can consider putting a superposition of address, while the output will also be a superposition of the address and the associated uh, quantum state of the memory. So therefore, you actually can achieve a quantum random access memory by using this binary tree structure. And so, so that is actually the simple idea of how to build a quantum random access memory using a quantum controlled quantum switch router. Okay. Now, uh, furthermore, these routers, uh, we can also like uh, look into the properties of these routers. So first, it is a very wide quantum circuit because it needs like of order n quantum bits to execute it. However, it is very shallow. The depth of the quantum circuit, which is comparable to depth of the tree, which scale logarithmically with the size of the quantum memory. So even if you have millions of classical bits of memory at the end of the, the leaves, this depth of this QRAM, it only scales logarithmically. So let's say log base two with a million is only like a depth of 20. So basically this is actually a very interesting circuit which allow you to achieve a non-trivial task while the depths only scale logarithmically with the size of the circuit while it actually can execute something useful, which I think it can potentially be a near, near term noise intermediate scale application. Okay. So, Moreover, this quantum run access memory, it is actually general purpose. It works for any data. So it can be useful for like a global search or potentially quantum machine learning and so on. And also these devices, we can also make, make more specific designs so that these quantum uh, controlled quantum signal router can be like implemented using two dimensional superconducting circuit architecture or 3D superconducting circuit architecture or even atom array with ripple couplings. So, so there are potentially many experimental platforms can implement such a quantum router. And some of my collaborators at Yale and Chicago, they're trying to implement such a device. So one natural question people ask, how robust it is for such a device? Because you have many qubits and will it be sensitive to the qubit error? And if you have error correction, what will be the resource overhead? So I would say it is true we need many physical hardware to build a quantum router, which might indicate that maybe not everyone will have a, such a quantum random access memory, but maybe we can share the quantum random access memory over a quantum network so that all users can have access to it without having uh, each one have to buy a quantum random access memory. However, it seems a bit uh, daunting to have the error which might scale inversely with the size of the QRAM because that would be like a required, maybe you need a full error correction with large scale. And if you do error correction, potentially you can further increase the resource overhead. So that probably may be a bit like a challenging if you want to have something useful in the near term. However, there are actually earlier studies by by Giovanetti, Seth Lloyd, and the collaborators, they find that if you assume your router error model to be like a router can be perfect if you, the router is in a waiting state, while it only have error in the zero one state, then there's only a logarithmic number of routing nodes, which is not in the W state that may suffer from error. 
Therefore, the total infidelity will scale logarithmically with the size of the memory. Then in that case, actually, you may achieve a high fidelity quantum RAM with a reasonable like a gate error. So, but in practice, we know that there is no such thing as a perfect quantum state that don't suffer from error. Okay, so therefore, that we actually would have errors in those waiting states if we want to have them. So therefore, the error might seem that, okay, they again have a linear with n sites that may suffer from error. So again, the error infidelity would decrease linearly with the size of the QRA. But one surprising finding that actually like uh, um, my collaborators and I have found is actually this is not true. It turns out that if you only care about the output state with address and the bus with carrying the information, and you don't care about the state of this router after that, because we only need the router to query, and we actually can trace out the router after that, we find that in reality, that the infidelity only still scale logarithmically with the size of the QRAN rather than linearly. Therefore, it should be possible to still have robust or high fidelity QRAN, even though we have a large scale QRAN. And this might sound counterintuitive, right? Because there are so many sites that may have error, why we still only suffer the error logarithmically. And here is just a, some like more intuitive, like a sketch of the proof to give you the idea. Okay, so notice that if you have a pass and along the pass there's error, that guarantees that pass will fail. And if a pass don't hit an error, then actually that pass will be successful. Okay, this is kind of more in the classical perspective. But in the quantum case, we may have a superposition of all these passes going on, right? And the question is, suppose we have some like random errors spread over these nodes, then what will be the total infidelity that will result in, in the output state? So first, as one can easily see, as you go down deep in the level, there are more of the nodes that may suffer from the error. It increased exponentially with the level two to the L. However, uh, the weight or the influence or the infidelity due to those errors that further, when you go further down the tree, it actually decreases exponentially. Or put another way is that if you have error somewhere at this third level, the chance that it will hit a pass is actually decreases as two to the minus L. It's like one over eighth. It will hit the pass if you choose the pass randomly. Okay, if you think in terms of the quantum term, actually the errors that are closer to the deeper down in the tree, it actually will have a less entangled with the entire states. So it actually will have a less error imparting to the output state. So now you have more sites may have error, but the error weight decrease also exponentially. So when you put those weights and add them up, you'll find that actually this exponential overhead actually cancels with the exponential suppression. So when you add them up, you actually again restore this logarithmic scaling with the depth of the tree. Uh, logarithmic, uh, with the proportional to depth of a tree or logarithmic scaling with the size of the quantum router. Okay, to verify that this is true, we actually perform a numerical simulation. And here consider different errors like depolarization, bit flip, dephasing, damping, or heating errors, while the horizontal axis in, is in the, uh, uh, is the log of the size of the random access memory. So sort of go from two to a thousand qubits. And uh, the vertical axis is the log of the infidelity. And this uh, shaded region is actually indicating that so the prediction by the, from the upper, upper bounded by the error estimate from theory and these dots are the numerical estimates. And we find that all these numerical estimate uh, simulated values, it's below the upper bound of the theory and has a similar slope that indicating that our error actually scale logarithmically with the size of the quantum random access memory n. Okay, so now basically that it is true that the quantum random access memory will still need many qubits, but the error scale only logarithmically with the size of the QRAM. So therefore, even though the M may be large, maybe a million or billion, but the log of that quantity is still very small. So therefore, we might still expect that with a reasonable fidelity quantum device, we might still be able to build a large scale QRAM so that you can potentially do something useful. And if needed, 
the QRAM device can still be compatible with error correction, but maybe we don't need a really large scale error correction. Maybe we just need a relatively small scale error correction to correct the error so that epsilon is sufficiently small compared to the log of the size of the QRAM so that we can build a large scale fault tolerant QRAM. Okay, so now I talked a lot about the QRAM. And uh, one potential useful use for QRAM, as I mentioned, it may be like very resource demanding, is to put it in a quantum network. So here is a quantum random access memory, and we put it uh, within uh, in a large scale quantum network. Then the node with a QRAM, we call it a quantum data center, which is kind of a minimum definition of a quantum data center. It consists of a quantum random access memory embedded in a larger scale quantum network while all users on the quantum network will have access to the QRAM so that they can make a query over the QRAM and uh, get uh, only uh, like uh, the address and uh, the corresponding bus qubits of the information that they want. But that information they send over the quantum channel only scale logarithmically with the size of the QRAM. So it's an efficient use of quantum channel to query a large data center without having to have the data center next to their quantum computer. So this would be like a potentially very efficient way to enable like a, uh, like a local node processing while outsourcing the big data center uh, to help you to make a query of a large classical database. So, so far I'm mostly talking about the quantum data center in the context for like quantum computing, uh, making like an efficient query. So potentially you can use it for private a blind quantum computing. And turns out you can also use it uh, for, for, uh, com uh, for communication with private queries. And also you can use the QRAM also for something like a distributed sensing or data compression, because you can run the QRAM backwards and uh, achieve like efficient compression so that uh, with, uh, uh, for example, one application will be like a large quantum, uh, like a large scale, long baseline quantum telescope. And the, one of the challenges is that it's really hard to send a single photon over long distances. And uh, the idea proposed by Gottesman and others is to build quantum repeater to teleport those astronomical photons. So you will build a long baseline optical quantum telescope. But most of the incoming optical photons are vacuum. So therefore you can actually use QRAM here to compress these uh, modes for the astronomical photons and then send the encoded states by quantum repeaters for build, to build like large scale long baseline optical telescopes. So, so here I would say like maybe here is just a list of potential applications of this large scale quantum data, a quantum data center, which is a QRAM connected to quantum network for quantum computing, communication, and sensing. Mm -hmm. And we're actually working on a manuscript to, to try to uh, illustrate these ideas. So I think I'm almost running out of time. So here's just a summary that I talk about like a, how to use quantum repeaters to achieve a long distance quantum communication by detecting and correcting errors. And there's the fundamental limits of how one can achieve what's the quantum channel capacity and how to design efficient codes to achieve it. And uh, by concatenating con bosonic or continuous variable and discrete variable coding, we can actually have a better performance than operating these two codes separately. And finally, talk about the quantum data center by using quantum controlled quantum signal router to build a QRAM, put in a quantum network, which will allow us to achieve potentially some novel applications for computing, communication, and sensing. So finally, I would like to thank the people who actually who worked on this uh, quantum network and also quantum random access memory and also collaborators and funding agencies. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that great talk. Um, we had a really, really active chat actually throughout your entire talk. So um, I think we have time for a few more questions. So I'll see if I can get to those really quick. Um, so the first question is uh, GKP was used for correcting photon loss. What other types of errors are corrected by the second layer of codes? Yeah, and that's a good question. So for GKP, it's, uh, it actually can correct uh, not only photon loss, but also like added thermal noise, or even if you have small dephasing, it can correct it if you have finite energy GKP. And however, as I illustrated in this curve, even though the uh, in, in this 
maybe let me show here that even though like you may push like a really have a low GKP with a low error with a, say 10 to minus four, it's still not perfect. Okay. So there's still some residual like uh, sub percentage errors. And when you have uh, hundreds or thousands of repeater stations, those errors will accumulate. And moreover, this 10 to minus four error at the logical level is actually assuming you have optimum recovery with perfect operation. But we know like in practice, it's not going to be perfect. So there will be like more residual operation errors that will need the next level of error correction to correct. So that's why we put a second layer of a discrete variable error correction to correct those errors. Yeah. Okay, great. That was a great answer. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think I know the answer to this next one, but uh, someone asked, we are using fiber optic cables here. Is there any chance of a wireless version in the future? Uh, yes. So one possibility is you can use free space for communication because uh, actually, fortunately, like uh, our optical modes are still pretty cold compared to the cosmic ray background radiation. Uh, and, uh, and, and or if you could have a really high Q cavity for your microwave devices, you may also consider like uh, remove those. Okay, you cool it down so that you can potentially achieve wireless communication within that particular range, region. Yeah, but, but uh, yeah, I would say like, oh, if you want, it probably would be easier to go to optical domain to achieve that communication. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, maybe we'll wrap up with one last question here. Um, so with this technology, is it going to be possible to cluster quantum computers across the world on some type of entangled task? Yeah, so um, I think that's a pretty, pretty here that two technologies here. One is uh, like repeaters allow you to build a large scale network, quantum network. And the other technology is this quantum a data center or quantum random access memory. So I think that, uh, yes, it, it should be possible. Like with both of these, then you can potentially have some dedicated nodes for QRAM to access the large scale quantum data, uh, classical data, and convert into quantum so that other nodes can process those data without having excess number of uh, quantum bits. Okay, cool, cool. Um, all right, I think we are just about up on time here, but I think that was a really, really great talk. So thank you so much for being here today and, and for giving that excellent presentation. And like I said, the chat was really, really active throughout the entire talk. So thank you so much again. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Bye -bye. All right. Um, we're wrapping up for today, but thank you everybody for tuning in. We'll be here at the same place, same time next week. And so we will see you next time.